the opportunity to give gifts, to surprise people, to bless people. It's always exciting to do that. And year to year, different things make Christmas uh, extra special. Uh, family, uh, experiences, providences, blessings. And, and this year, for me, a great surprise. Uh, my, my cousin, Greg Dyer, and his wife, Jo Lynn, are with us. How long has it been since we've seen one another, brother? Almost 20 years. So, don't know about y'all, my Christmas is made. <laughs> my Christmas is made. Mm. What a blessing. What a dear family he comes from. Appreciate y'all being with us today. Turn in your Bibles to Luke 1. 26 to 38. What I'm going to do the next three weeks, God willing, we're going to look at voices surrounding the incarnation. Today, angel voices. Uh, next week, the voices of the women. Uh, the week following, on the 30th, the voices of the men. Luke chapter 1, verses 26 to 38, it's what we're reading today. I want you to stand with me, follow along in your Bibles. If you don't have a Bible with you, we've got uh, the text on the screen for you so that we can all engage with and be engaged by the Scriptures. Follow along as I read. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, or really stop being afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. What have we just read together? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient word of God. And I pray today that we will hear the angelic message in a fresh way and understand and draw from this that if angelic beings who can never taste the saving grace of God as sons and daughters of Adam and Eve can, that we will see how intensified is our responsibility in announcing good news. Thank you. Please be seated. After 400 years of silence, we talked about this in, on our Sunday evening study, and we were looking at that intertestamental period between the Old Testament and the New. 400 years where there was not a prophetic voice given to the people of God. There had been no word from God 400 years, no word from the prophets 400 years, no word from angelic messengers 400 years. After 400 years, the silence is shattered. And it's shattered by several angelic appearances and proclamations surrounding the approaching birth of God's long-awaited Messiah. They were declaring that God was breaking his silence by breaking into history in the person of his Son, the blessed second person of the Trinity, whom he would name Jesus. We'll look at that next week. Jesus, for he would save his people from their sins. The events that followed 
would change everything and split time into B.C. and A.D. And so today we're going to look at the angels as prominent silence breakers, prominent noise makers surrounding the incarnation, the coming of God in the flesh of Jesus, who was the son of Mary and the son of God. We're going to hear the angel story today of this history-changing event. We're going to hear how they proclaimed the birth of Jesus, who is the reason for the season. I came across a graphic recently, and I went back to try to find it, and I couldn't. Uh, and it was half of a Christmas wreath. You would recognize that as half of a Christmas wreath. And the other half of the circle was a crown of thorns. He is the reason for the season. And so what did the angels say? Well, we just read to you, and we'll look at this again, uh, what they said to Mary. But they said something to Joseph. If you want to look at Matthew 1, 20 to 21. The text tells us, As he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. The text says that he was considering these things. What things was he considering? Well, if you back up in the text to verses 18 and 19, Matthew tells us the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, betrothal, by the way, was, a, was the ancient custom where they were, they were bound to marry. It was inevitable that they would marry. It was just like a marriage, except they had not had the ceremony and had not consummated the relationship. But for all intent and purposes, in, in the day that this took place, Joseph and Mary were husband and wife, inevitably. So it says, when she had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, before they had been joined in marriage, before they had gone to the wedding bed, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. We read that sentimentally, romantically. Joseph heard that as the ultimate tragedy. This precious teenage girl whom his parents had arranged for him to marry was found to be pregnant. What was a man to do? Well, the text goes on and says, And her husband Joseph, being a just man, here's his tension. He believes in justice. He believes in righteousness. God's law is clear that a betrothed woman who became pregnant before she was joined in marriage to her betrothed husband was to be stoned to death. The law, the law was very clear on this. He was a just man and unwilling to put her to that shame, resolved to dissolve the betrothal quietly. It would have looked something like this. He would have gone with his parents to her parents and say, we know what's the condition that Mary is in. We're not, we're not going to ask for justice under the law. But we understand and you understand that this cannot go forward. We will have a breaking of the betrothal the parents would have been shamed at that level in that family situation. They would have sent her away to a relative where she would have remained until she gave birth. And then they would decide whether she could ever come back to her town again or not. 
because she had brought reproach upon the family. This is what Joseph faced. And we need to, we need to empathize with him. We need to delve into the pathos with him. They weren't reading from a script. When he found out this news, he had not heard what he hears in verse 20 as he was considering these things, thinking it through, heartbroken, no doubt. How can I bear to let her go? How can I live with people knowing that my betrothed shamed our relationship with this pregnancy out of wedlock? And one of the announcing angels came. You know, in the, in the angel structure and hierarchy, there are, there's the archangel. Uh, Michael served in that capacity. There are announcing angels. Gabriel seems to be the, one of the chief announcing angels. Well, these angels, they're, they're guardian angels. You, you hear about that. Some people make too much of that. Some people make too little of that. The angels lived. You get Isaiah 6, you get this taste of what the angels live for, what they love to do. They cry out in Isaiah 6, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. They have their six-winged creatures, the cherubim, and they, and they cover uh, their eyes before the presence of God because he is so holy. They cover their, their modesty before him, and with two wings they fly, Isaiah 6 tells us this. And they are, they are engaging in antiphonal response. One group cries, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. And they respond, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The whole earth is full of his glory. They, they continue to lift up praise to their creator. They adore him, though they exist in a condition for which they will never taste the saving blood of Jesus Christ on their behalf. You know the story, if you know your Bible, that one third of the angelic host followed Lucifer, who at that time was an archangel figure, in an attempt to usurp the authority of God. They were immediately cast out of heaven, never to return. Hell was created for the devil and his angels. And so these beings exist to praise and worship God with no possibility of recovery should they sin against him. So here they are, announcing. Joseph's wondering, what shall I do? And here comes the answer. Joseph, son of David. He's in the line of David. He, he would be one of those qualified to, to be an heir of the Messiah when the Messiah comes. Do not fear to take Mary as your wife. That had to be shocking words. For that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit, from the, from the Spirit of God himself. The same Spirit of God who at creation was hovering over the darkness, hovering over that which had not been taken, had not taken on shape and form. He has hovered over Mary. He has caused the miraculous conception of the second person of the Trinity into her womb. That which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. And she will bear a son. Every Jewish man wanted a son. Oh, they loved their daughters, but they wanted a son because in the, in the son was the continuance of the family name. In the Son was authority and power. And so they longed for a Son. In the Son was the prospect of Messiah. Every noble Jewish father or father-to-be would long for a Son to grow up to be God's Messiah. And so we hear this, you shall bear a, she shall bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. Jesus is the, if we said it in the Greek, it would be Jesus. It's very much uh, similar to, to the Hispanic Jesus. Jesus, it, is, it means God is Savior. It is the Greek equivalent of the Old Testament 
uh, Messias. Call his name Jesus. Joseph knew what was being said. For he will save his people out of their sins. Now there he is. You talk about a dilemma. The justice of the law says, have her stoned to death. The mercy of Joseph and his family says, divorce her and have her go to a relative to have the baby. But no harm will come to her. The grace of God says, marry her. For she is carrying the Messiah. And you will play a role. Stepfather, foster father, you will be the one. You'll be the, the human man entrusted with the raising and nurturing of God's Messiah. There's, you have to see some irony here. You, a carpenter, will raise a son and teach him to work with wood. And one day, he will hang on that wood to save his people from their sins. And so this, this announcement by the angel called upon Joseph to act on faith. Put yourself there for a minute. Did I just imagine this? Am I, am I hallucinating? Am I trying to justify my desire to marry? All these things it just took an, an act of faith to say, I will do this. He was minded to put her away. He talked to his family about this, and now he goes back to his family and says, I can't do it. I'm going to marry her. Walk through that for a moment. How can you do this to us, Joseph? Because an angel told me to marry her. And then what we, the passage we read where the angel Mary has this encounter. In the sixth month, the sixth month is the sixth month of the pregnancy of Elizabeth, her cousin. The angel Gabriel, this seems to be the chief announcing angel, sent from God to the city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin, a young woman who had never been sexually intimate with a man, who was betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. And, and there's almost an understatement here in Luke when it says, But she was greatly troubled. <laughs> greatly troubled? Shocked. Stunned. Greetings. Oh, favored one. The idea of being a favored one, you could say, uh, as my friend R.F. Gates used to say, greetings be graced one. You have found favor with God. Every noble Jewish woman wanted to be the mother of Messiah. That would be her highest achievement in life. If she were to give birth to a son who would be God's anointed one, the Lord is with you. She was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. What, what is going on here? What am I hearing? Again, put yourself there. Am I imagining this? Is, this? is this real? And the angel kept talking to her. Stop being afraid, Mary. Fear not. Stop being afraid. For you have found favor with God. Now he says it again in a little different way. He calls her highly favored one when he introduces himself. You found favor with God for a Jewish wife, soon to be a mother. Nothing better in life could happen than this. Her husband could treat her the best that any husband ever treated a wife. And yet to, know, to hear that you have found favor with God. And behold... You will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. Mary is told a son is on the way. Mary is given the name by which she will call him. 
Joseph is told, a son is on the way. And here's the name by which you will call him. There was no discussion about what this child's name was going to be. It was settled in heaven. No discussion about which family member would we assign to the name of this son to carry on the, the name and history of the family and the heritage of the family. No. This is going to happen. And then she's told he will be great. Will be called the son of the most high. Again, designation, the Son of the Most High is Messiah, the highest God, the great and only God. You're going to give birth to His Son. And the Lord God will give to Him the throne of His father, David. Language designed to say that the one who the prophets promised would sit on David's throne forever is going to be your child. He will give the throne of his father David and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. That's the language. He is the Messiah. And of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary is desperately wanting to believe this. This was How, how foolish would she be to pray and long to carry and give birth to Messiah? She's dealing with the dilemma that, that she's going to conceive even though she's not yet married. And there's a tension here. And she says to the angel, how will this be since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. It's very similar language to Genesis Again, the Spirit of God brooding over the face of the deep. Therefore, the child to be born to you will be called holy. She understood that word. Holy was the word that meant set apart unto God's service, set apart from sin, the Son of God. And then to give her tangible, concrete, evidence of this to bolster her faith and behold your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son and this is the sixth month with her who has been called barren who was told she couldn't conceive a child how can this be Mary nothing is impossible for God that's how it can be Nothing is impossible for God. And I love Mary's response. We need to learn from this. Behold, I mean, what is she after all? When, when you distill her to her essence, what is she? I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be done to me according to your word. No protestation here, no. But, but I'm betrothed. I'm to be married to Joseph. I should not be carrying a baby in my womb until after I'm married to Joseph. This is totally inappropriate. This will, this will, this will throw everything into chaos. None of that. What will my family say? What will my neighbors say? What will my relatives say? What will Joseph say? What will his family say? None of that. Behold, I'm the servant of the Lord. Let it be done to me just as you have said it. And of course, we know in the narrative, if you read the incarnation narrative, she went and visited Elizabeth. And when Mary spoke, the baby who we would come to know as John the Baptist, who was in her womb in six months in just gestation, leaps inside the womb of Elizabeth. And, and Elizabeth says, to what do I owe this special greeting? My baby leapt within my womb when he heard the voice of my Lord. And so it was the con confirmation that God put the exclamation point on it. 
Someone has observed that the first human being to acknowledge the Messiah was an unborn baby. An unborn baby. That should say something to evangelicals who live in the, in the death culture of abortion. So Mary is a wonderful example for us. And then we have this, these words spoken to the shepherds. Luke 2, 8 to 12 says, In the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were filled with great fear. They're just common shepherds doing what they did every day uh, during the season of watching the sheep, feeding the sheep, taking them out of the sheepfold onto the hillside, watching carefully so that wild animals would cut, not come and ravage the flock. They were committed as shepherds to not lose one. That was the measure of their success. If they took their sheep onto the hillsides to graze and then took them back in the safety of the sheepfold and could count them all there, they were successful shepherds. And this angel of the Lord appears to them. The glory of the Lord. We've talked about that before. In the Old Testament, when the children of Israel were traveling in the wilderness, they designed at God's description the tabernacle. And we know, that, we know that they traveled during the day in that hot desert with a, with a cloud hovering over them that covered the entire uh, several million people traveling and it kept them from burning up in the desert sun. And at night, when the sun disappeared, the desert would become very, very cold at night. And this, this large cloud that covered them in the day to keep them from, from uh, heat exhaustion turned into a pillar of fire at night and it kept them warm as it hovered over the assembly. And then as the tabernacle was built and finished, there were times when God would speak with Moses and his leaders and, uh, and this, this bright shining cloud would descend upon the tabernacle, into the tabernacle, and that was called the Shekinah. The Shekinah, the, the, the beaming brilliance signifying the presence of God. And so, these shepherds who would have been schooled in Jewish history knew something on the note of the spectacular was occurring. The glory of the Lord shone around them. When the Shekinah would descend into the tabernacle, it was the sign that said God invites his people to meet. God has a word to give to his people. And so this, this glory of God surrounds these shepherds. We talked about this briefly the other night at, uh, at our deacon staff uh, Christmas party. And they were filled with great fear. They were terrified. They've been enveloped in beaming, brilliant light. And the angel says to them, stop being afraid. For behold, I'm here. And they might have thought they were about to be destroyed on the hillside. I bring you good news. The term good news, of course, in the Greek is the euangelion. It, if you transliterate it, it's, it's the evangel. It's the gospel. Bring you good news. And the good news pronounces great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you, you, lowly shepherds, not highly regarded in society, if the people thought anything about the announcing of the Messiah coming, they would have been taught to believe that the announcement of the Messiah coming would have been shared with the Sanhedrin the religious elite, 
not to lowly shepherds on a hillside. For unto you is born this day in the city of David. The city of David is known as Bethlehem. And when you break it down, it literally means house of bread. You could say the bread of life has come to be born in the house of bread. In the house of bread, you will find bread to feed your souls. It will be good news with great joy. Who is Christ the Lord. Now we have the, the, the Christos here. And the Lord, the, the Kurios, the, he is come to reign. He has come to rule. He has come to call people to submit to him. And this will be a sign for you. Now think about this for a minute. Joseph was given no sign. Joseph was simply told, this is where we are, this is what's happened, and this is what you're to do. Mary is given a sign. Go talk to Elizabeth. The shepherd is given a sign. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. Well, you know the rest of the story. They looked at one another and said, let's go, let's go to Bethlehem and let's see this thing that's been told to us, which, which the Lord's made known. We've, we've got to go. And, and the scriptures are fascinating. It says they, and they made haste. We really we made haste. No, the Greek there is they jumped the fences. If you were in the animal husbandry industry, you regarded fences. You didn't violate fences. You recognized fences were boundaries of property. And these angels leave their flock. I mean, these shepherds, I mean, leave their flock. And they jump the fences. They take the shortest distance. I, I, I didn't know much geometry. I barely passed geometry. It was one of the tough courses. But I knew this, that the shortest distance between two points was a straight line. And the, and the, the shepherds say, here we are. There's Bethlehem. And they took off. And got there. And of course, when they get there, what do they find? They find Mary. They find Joseph. They find the baby in the manger, just as they've been told. And so these angels share good news with unlikely people. Think about this, folks. Who the angels? And we know, of course, also, we're, and suddenly, and we're going to look at this in a moment, suddenly, because they speak to God as well. They've been sent from God. There was the chief announcing angel who was in charge of the whole matter. And I do believe, I think Peter says, in fact, Peter says in his writing that the angels stand on tiptoe, peering into this. Now, I think they did that the whole time of the incarnation. I think they were fascinated that God would send the second person of the Trinity whom they had worshipped for all of eternity, that he would have him leave heaven, go into the womb of a, of a, of a woman, be born uh, as a man under the law to redeem sinners from the curse of the law. I think the angels were just fascinated with that. In fact, Peter says they peer into the church. They look today, folks. They want to understand this grace that they will never experience. They want to know what difference did it make for that precious darling of heaven to come to earth. How have people been changed by that? So God sent them. But they could not speak to Joseph, to Mary, to the shepherds without praising God for the message they were privileged to deliver. Luke 2, 13 and 14, And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest place. And on earth, peace and this is the rendering of it in the original. Doesn't make a very, very good Hallmark card. Peace on earth, goodwill to men. But here's what it says. Glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace among those with whom 
he is pleased. They explode on that mountainside. There's a, an anthem that I was introduced to when Karen and I were at Broadmoor Baptist Church and the choir would sing it every Christmas. Written by Tom Fetke, F-E-T-T-K-E-E -E -E or something. Called That Night. And when it gets to the, the chorus, and the heavens exploded, the music filled the air. And the angels came from heaven to earth to declare the birth of the Son, the Son of God, the Savior of the world. Glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased. And so it's, it's in this, again, be a shepherd for a moment. One announcing angel descending in such a way that the, Shekinah, the glory of God surrounds you. Shocked them, terrified them so that the angel had to say, stop being afraid. And then he is followed by a multitude these ten thousands and thousands of angels who, who could, there's an old hymn we sang growing up, he could have called ten thousand angels when he's at the cross, who were there. The devil told the truth when he told Jesus that jump off the temple, that the angels won't let you be hurt. Here they come. And the fascinating thing to me about this is that as they poured out of heaven, intensely praising God and saying, God be glorified, God be praised for this event, they restrained themselves at Calvary as they watched. They could have taken him off the cross. You gotta, so you've got to think about the incarnation in light of the cross of Jesus. All he had to do at the cross was to look longingly toward the angels. They would have come. They would have come. Yet he didn't. And they didn't. But they dared not hold back as they were summoned by the announcing angel and no doubt sent by God to attend with him to light up that countryside praising God glorifying God and saying that God is glorified when he distributes peace to those with whom he's pleased the, the word peace we've studied this before it's the it's the Greek greeting Irene if you were if you had lived in that culture and bumped into one another we, the common greeting would be Irene and you would say back to me Irene and what that means is we're okay we, we have peace with one another if I said Irene to you and you didn't respond that meant we, we're not okay or if I just walked past you and didn't say that then the message to the other person is we're not okay we need to get right Peace, a God offended by sin, reconciled by a Savior. And if I've trusted that Savior and you've trusted that Savior, then we're at peace with God and we're at peace with one another. Because the essence of the, of the gospel is the word reconciliation. Glory to God. And on earth, peace among those with whom he's pleased. How, how do you get in a position to have God pleased with you. There's only one way. By repenting of your sin. Acknowledging before God that you came into this world as a son or daughter of Adam and Eve, a sinner condemned to die. And yet in time you come to recognize yourself as a sinner and you trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You acknowledge that God is right, that you are a sinner deserving of hell and death and damnation. And yet you recognize also what I know that God sent Jesus. That's what this whole narrative is about. God so loving the world that he sends his only begotten son. That whosoever is believing in him will not perish but have everlasting life. And you trust Jesus 
as the one and only who can deliver you from the just condemnation of God. That's how you find yourself pleased. God being pleased with you. These angels teach us something. They teach us in speaking to Joseph that we should be willing to accept the word of God and act on it. Even, think about it, even when it goes against everything I think I know and I definitely feel. Let God be true and every man a liar. He teaches us in, in Mary. Sometimes in life, difficult providences come to us. And they don't make sense to us. And, and on its surface, it, it seems as if they will wreck us and ruin us. And yet we come to recognize when it's all said and done, and Jesus said this in Luke's gospel, you're just a servant called to obey. When it's all said and done, we're servants. Lord, I don't, I don't like the sound of this. I don't, I don't like what I think. I don't like what I feel. But I am your servant. May it be done to me as you have said. And the shepherds, you take the spectacular and you don't dwell and talk about the spectacular. Because <laughs> the rest of the story of the shepherds is that when they had seen the baby, just as they'd been told they would, that they said, let us go tell these things that have been shown to us, which the Lord has brought to pass. They went and shared good news. The spectacular event of your salvation is designed to stir you up to speak about the spectacular love and grace of God shown to sinners in Jesus Christ. We learn that. And then finally we learn that however we move through life, we are at our best when we give glory to God. Glory to God. When we act as we've taught in the catechism, what is the chief end of man? The chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. We ask our children, why did God make you in all things? to glorify him. Well, how do you glorify God? By loving him and doing what he commands. And why should you glorify God? Because he made me. He takes care of me. And we would add to that. And he sent his son to die for me. And we recognize that people we touch in life, that their greatest need is to have a biblical basis to know that God has been reconciled to them and us to him by the blood of Jesus. It doesn't matter what else in life a person has. They can gain the whole world. But if it cannot be said of them, peace on earth among those with whom he is well pleased, then they lose it all. And this is the season perhaps the season of all seasons, that people will hear that, that people will listen to that. Don't miss this opportunity. We told you the word angel is simply the Greek angelos. It means messenger. You may not have wings today. And by the way, reports notwithstanding, when you and I get to heaven, we still won't have wings. You may not have wings today, but if you've been saved by the grace of God, you are a messenger. You're called to be a messenger of good news, of great joy, which can be received by all people. It just remains for us to tell it. Will you do that? Will you do that? Family get-togethers, office parties, neighborhood gatherings, will you do that? If the angels who can never taste the grace of God would do this with the intensity they do, how much more should sons and, daughter, sons and daughters of Adam and Eve who've been washed in the blood of the Lamb outdo the announcing angels? Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, 
You're the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and we bow before you today in Jesus' name, thankful for the narratives that we have in your word that show us the excitement that surrounded the birth of Jesus Christ. Dear God, never let us lose the wonder. Never let us lose the wonder. Never let us lose the energy to declare the good news, knowing that if we have received Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, it's news of great joy to us, and it can bring great joy to any and all who will receive this gospel message of the Son of God coming, living, dying, rising again, and coming again soon. We make our prayer in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. We're going to